The Battle of Stalingrad was a five month long battle that saw the destruction of the German 6th Army, but the bloodshed around the city was catastrophic. It was estimated that there were 2 million total casualties during the battle, and there was an untold cost on civilian life too. Stalingrad was the deadliest battle that took place during the Second World War, and is one of the bloodiest in history. It's considered a major turning point in the whole of World War II, as it marked a time where following this, the tide in the conflict turned against the Germans heavily. It shifted the whole balance of the conflict towards the Soviets on the Eastern Front, but what was life really like during the battle, and during one of the bloodiest that the world has ever seen? Remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Stalingrad was of vital importance for both the Germans and the Soviets, as it was seen as a major transport and industrial centre on the Volga River. Whichever side controlled the city meant they had access to the oil fields of the Caucasus, and also they could control the Volga. At the time the Germans were suffering with a slow deteriorating amount of fuel and supplies, so for Hitler and the German military hierarchy to take Stalingrad was of paramount importance. But the fighting inside of the city was truly barbaric, with house to house street fighting turning the city into a great centre of urban warfare, and each house was considered a victory for each side, such was the importance of controlling the city. It was on the 23rd of August 1942 that the German 6th Army reached the outskirts of the city, pursuing the 62nd and 64th armies, which had retreated back into the city. It was said by the Germans that the capture of Stalingrad was subsidiary to the main aim. It was only of importance as a convenient place in the bottleneck between the Don and the Volga, where we could block an attack on our flank by Russian forces coming from the east. At the start, Stalingrad was no more than a name on a map to us. But this name on the map became one of the most iconic linked to the Second World War. Life inside of the city became very tough. From a Soviet perspective, just weeks before, in response to the German advances towards the city, Stalin issued a no-step-back order or decree. This meant that any Soviet soldier was banned from retreating in any manner, and if they did they would be shot and executed. General Vasily Choykov, for example, described how he shot a number of commanders as their soldiers watched in formation for retreating without being granted permission. He stated, When I got to the army headquarters, I was in a vile mood. Three of my deputies had fled, but the main thing was we had no dependable combat units, and we needed to hold out for three or four days. We immediately began to take the harshest possible actions against cowardice. On the 14th, I shot the commander and commissar of one regiment, and a short while later, I shot two brigade commanders and their commissars. This caught everyone off guard. We made sure the news of this got to the men. The Soviet Union was operating munition factories 24 hours a day, in the eastern part of the country, and the stubborn fighting in Stalingrad prevented the Germans moving further. The Soviets dug in inside the city, and the fighting was intensely brutal. It was said, over a month has passed since the fighting of Stalingrad was still mentioned. The Russians go on fighting in this hell, filled with dense clouds and acrid smoke, bombed, shelled, and machine gun constantly, but they still resist, and still counter-attack. Sometimes single units have to repel 10 tanks in a day. The nurses, after picking up the wounded, take them across the Volga River in rowing boats, for there is no building in Stalingrad large enough or safe enough to be used as a hospital. The wreckage of boats and ships with dead soldiers and civilians is floating down the river. It was said on the 26th of September, our regiment is heavily involved in constant heavy fighting. You don't see them at all. They have established themselves in houses and cellars, and are firing on all sides, including from our rear. With regards to the Soviet fighting tactics, they are barbarians, they use gangster methods. The Russians have stopped surrendering at all. If we take any prisoners, it's because they are hopelessly wounded, and can't move themselves. Stalingrad is hell. Those who are merely wounded are lucky. They will doubtless be at home, and celebrate the victory with their families. The atmosphere inside the city from a Soviet perspective was a hellish one, where men continued to fight until they fell. They would fall to the last man to defend their city, and the Russians were willing to do anything to defeat the Germans. 
Both sides stopped at nothing to achieve victory, but eventually the Soviets would stand tall. The German 6th Army was formed at the start of Operation Barbarossa and was deemed to be the most powerful. Hitler believed it could storm the heavens, but it saw horrific losses. The 6th Army advanced deep into Soviet lands and up to Stalingrad, where the Soviets had gathered huge armies on the opposite side of the Volga. Initially things were good for the Germans, after their advancements, and their lives were relatively comfortable, but as things turned against them, things got very difficult especially for the 6th Army. The Soviets moved in a horrific artillery bombardment, and the Germans believed that the only way to escape this onslaught was through death or to go insane. As vast Soviet tank armies met the rear of the 6th Army in a huge pincer movement, Operation Uranus, the counter-offensive was a huge success. The reason this is important is because this marked the beginning of the end of the Battle of Stalingrad. Hitler refused to allow the 6th Army to fight its way out and to rejoin the German lines near the Don River. Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, assured Hitler that the encircled and surrounded 6th Army could be supplied by air, with Junkers cargo planes airdropping supplies. Hitler and Göring were warned that this would not work, but the advice was ignored. With the lack of aircraft, bad blizzards, anti-aircraft fire and enemy aircraft, only a tiny part of the trapped army could be supplied by air. This meant that the 6th Army who were encircled by the enemy began to starve at an alarming rate. The German soldiers were forced to kill their horses to eat just a few slices of meat. A knife was not good enough to cut through the meat as it was frozen solid by the weather and a hacksaw was needed. Because of this, thousands died from hunger in the freezing cold. The field hospitals were also suffering from huge overcrowding. Those with severe injuries were often left abandoned in the cold to succumb to their fate as nothing could be done and the nurses had to prioritise their patients. Severely injured men who were crawling in the snow were turned away for any care and only light flesh wounds were treated so the German soldiers could rejoin the fight. There was also outbreaks of lice which caused issues and the wounds that most suffered could not be treated. Most soldiers died from frostbite or the freezing conditions as the Germans did not have effective winter clothing to wear. As mentioned, lice spread typhus within the German army, and with this the disease and their strife, many German soldiers tore off their uniforms and tried to make a run for it to get away. The men of the 6th army were so weak that to pass the time, they could not even play cards and build toilets to ensure disease did not spread. They usually went to the toilet on a shovel and threw the contents away from their dugouts. The dead were left unburied, and often a disgusting stench emanated from the corpses. There was also a number of soldiers who died from mysterious sudden death syndrome as they were falling dead where they stood. It's believed this was due to a mixture of the hunger, cold and despair that they faced on a daily basis. Within the army a number of soldiers tried to take their own lives and inflicted wounds on themselves to try and get a train ticket back to Germany. A number of men willingly put their heads out above the dugouts praying for a Russian sniper to end their suffering. Within days German soldiers were losing kilograms of weight and Hitler ordered in solidarity that for the men of Stalingrad he would have no champagne served at his headquarters. Goering didn't bother with this show of solidarity, regularly eating heavily, whilst people in Berlin were also suffering from rationing. The German surrender which was accepted for many was seen as a life saver, but then the remaining members of the 6th army and the German forces were then pressed into work in prison of war camps and gulags after and many never survived. It was said that the citizens of the Soviet Union wanted to take up arms against the Germans, and they understood the duty to defend Stalingrad, and make sure it did not fall to the Germans, but also civilians saw action. Some of them remained inside the city during the attacks, and were placed into worker battalions. These battalions were armed, and were sent to the front lines to help the Red Army defend against the Germans, but the problem was, they were not the most well trained. It was said, during the brutal bombardments the people came together, took their weapons and were immediately sent to the front lines. We delivered these worker battalions to the front headquarters. When the workers came to the front, they joined the Red Army and their mission was the same. The workers battalions were willing to do whatever, but they were no match for the superior firepower of the Germans. Because of this, they suffered heavy losses.
They were poorly equipped, mostly only with rifles. There was a lack of equipment with the workers' battalions, and at the time there was a shortage of weapons. It was said when they captured enemy weapons, they used these against the Germans. For most of the civilians who remained inside of the city, every day it was considered that this could have been their last. They would wake up to the sound of air raids with the Luftwaffe bombing the city heavily, and they remained unchallenged in the air, free to bomb any targets that they wished, and many civilian targets were hit, resulting in huge casualties. Around 40,000 civilians, it's estimated, died in the city during the German bombing campaigns. But as the Germans advanced towards the city, and took different parts of it, the disruption for the civilians was hugely great. One woman, a mother of six, was forced out of her house, and then her family were forced to wait out artillery fire in a ditch. During this one attack, her husband and little girl were killed, and the family were trapped. This was common, as the civilians were forced out of their homes at gunpoint. There was a huge problem within the city, with a struggle for food, and also basic necessities. Food and water became a big problem. The Germans, when they were surrounded, ate the horse meat, and the civilians were left with legs, the head and the offal, with no regards for the civilian population. Around 40,000 people from the city were taken back to Germany as slave workers, and many fled during the battle, with only a very small few being evacuated. They did whatever they could to survive. There were reports of cannibalism from the city, and stories of civilian warriors fighting German units themselves with their bare hands to try and help. But many people starved to death as they were struggling for something to eat, and in the harsh winter things got very tough. Another issue was sanitation, as much of the fighting and bombing had caused damage to the infrastructure in the city. Because of this, dysentery and illness was common, and in the winter, even going to the toilet was dangerous. But one grace in the winter was that water came in the form of snowfall and falling snow, which allowed many to have a constant water supply. Obviously, as the city was constantly under attack, large amounts of infrastructure of the city, such as schools, hospitals and civic buildings, were destroyed, leaving a complete wreck of a city for those fortunate enough to see out the battle. For civilians living in the city, it was truly hell on earth. Those who lived on the German side were eventually transported to German work camps and concentration camps. Their property in the city's banks and buildings were all looted, and there were significant and widespread executions that occurred within the city. It was noted that on a daily basis, soldiers from each side would walk past the corpses of civilians that had been strung up from trees and posts. The people were surviving on whatever they could, and their homes became nooks and crannies. Soviet soldiers did share their rations when they could, but even these were measly and were insufficient for anyone. As mentioned, most of the civilian population were evacuated or had left. The population in 1939 was around 445,000, but by the end of the battle, there were only 32,000 who remained in the city, mostly in the southern part. 50,000 people did return following the battle in the first month, but the city they came back to was ruined. Their homes had literally become a battlefield. The Battle of Stalingrad saw the most brutal and bloody fighting of the whole of the Second World War. The average life expectancy for a Soviet soldier at Stalingrad was 24 hours, so within a day of reaching the front lines against the Germans, they would have been dead. But the story at Stalingrad, which is remembered today, is the capitulation of the German Sixth Army, and the fact the majority of the men froze in the harsh Russian conditions. For civilians, they had a great feeling of survival at any cost, and also anguish at seeing their own city being levelled to the ground. It's remembered today as a turning point of the Second World War, and for the huge cost that was inflicted on those who lived in the city, and by both armies, who fought so intently for the control of Stalingrad. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.